Great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, lovely to see you again. And what a fantastic turnout we've had today. Um, we're, we're really thrilled. When you organize an event like this, of course, you've no idea if anybody will come. And uh, so we've been delighted uh, with, the, with the number of people uh, who, who are in attendance. Thanks very much for all your participation this morning, um, for your comments and questions. And there'll be plenty of opportunities now uh, in the afternoon sessions uh, for, for your input. And we really do welcome that. Um, it's terribly important, I think, as we, we, we know, but we discovered this morning that you, that you really make sure that you're muted um, when you're not speaking or, 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 or um, that you're muted and, and only the uh, presenters or, or chair are speaking. Um, and uh, also just to say that um, I didn't get to say this at the end of the launch, but what a beautiful launch it was and so much uh, warmth coming back. Uh, from everybody uh, about that. A very, very special uh, launch that was indeed. And Helen has, um, just before the launch, uh, uh, got an email to say that the artist in academia is uh, available to purchase now and there's a 20% discount. Um, and so I think that uh, Orla may have posted that. Uh, she did indeed. Look, it's there again. 20% uh, discount available. Enter the code uh, at checkout. So. Uh, we encourage you to uh, to do that. So we're going to kick off now for the afternoon. We've got another session, uh, present uh, 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 three presenters, and then uh, we move into our roundtable uh, session in which we'll have some respondents and then an open discussion uh, for 45 minutes to 50 minutes. So really looking forward to that. Um, uh, Belinda Quirk at the uh, uh, Solstice Art Centre is uh, going to chair this session for us. And I'm going to pass over to you now, Belinda. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mel. Um, I just want to echo and just say what an absolutely amazing morning it was. Uh, it's very hard to get a certain sort of energy on Zoom. And I certainly felt it uh, through all the chat and especially at that launch as well. So um, congratulations, everyone. And actually, welcome from Solstice uh, in Avon. It's great to be part of Perspectives, Perspectives this afternoon. And it was just a really pleasure for Inbus to reach out and ask us to take part in this exciting day. And I'm particularly delighted to share this session with three diverse and unique artists, Trina Nihirhan, Brian Fay, and Danny McCarthy. And again, just because it was a little bit of an instance this morning, I will also reiterate the need to mute, please, uh, throughout the presentation. And yes, it's fantastic to have that wonderful chat function. And we'll be going, I'll be trying, and Kevin will be trying to sort of read out some of the questions afterwards and capture some of the momentum of this afternoon. So I'd very much like to welcome first uh, Trina Nihiakon uh, to present. Trina is Professor of Modern Irish and Performing Arts at Maynooth University. And in discussion this morning, Trina quickly mentioned in passing the phrase elasticity of form in relation to Irish traditional dance form. But perhaps this is appropriate to Trina herself as a whistle player, a Shano singer and author. And there's a whole myriad of interests, as you can see from the accompanying documentation, of lots of different pathways that uh, she's interested in, from oral poetry to song, tradition, Irish tradition, music, Irish language, oral theory, amongst others. So Trina here will look to speak to the correlation and experiality in traditional song and scholarship. And so thank you very much, Trina, and I'll hand it directly over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belinda, for that very generous welcome there, none of which I deserved, of course, but that's another story. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen there, so just bear with me one minute. I have some slides to kind of keep me on the straight and narrow. Now, can you see my title slide there? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, so um, I'm just going to, um, first of all, I'd just like to, to talk a little bit about uh, my own creative practice and my own interests as a performer. Um, as Belinda mentioned, um, 
I, I do a lot of kind of different things, you know, I, I, I write books and articles and all the rest of it, but even from the very earliest um, stages in my doctoral research, um, my scholarship has always been underpinned by performance. Um, and I'd like to speak a little bit about that particular knowledge that emanates from uh, creative practice in this talk today. But just to give you some um, information about myself, um, as Belinda mentioned, I'm a shamel singer and a whistle player, um, and I'm also a set dancer. And I'm particularly interested in my scholarship at the moment. I'm interested in subjugated knowledges and hidden histories of thought. And I suppose this is why I have such a fascination with practice-based knowledge, um, because in many ways it's, it's the quintessential hidden knowledge or the invisibilized knowledge. And um, in my recent scholarship, I've been looking at uh, hidden voices in Irish traditional song, uh, particularly women's voices. And I'm going to speak a little bit about that later on. Um, but I'm, I'm fascinated with domestic music making in particular and uh, when we look um, at the history of women's uh, performance practices in the Irish tradition uh, the domestic space and the workspace were, were really really important um, and so nowadays we think of you know performers in terms of stages and so forth um, but uh, traditionally at least um, the, the farmyard and the kitchen would have been, you know, a hotbed of ideas. Um, there would have been literally hundreds of songs being sung among women while they worked, possibly while sewing or while churning butter. Um, and that communal experience uh, was something that formed um, some of the greatest singers that we would have known about. For example, Bess Cronin from County Cork would have grown up in that sort of context. Um, so at the same time as these women having been amazing singers who would have had literally hundreds of songs in their repertoires and we know this because of the collecting work that would have been done um, from the beginning of the 20th century onwards uh, they also were frequently brilliant lilters and they used to lilt for dances and if we take the example of Bess Cronin for example the famous Cork singer um, she was particularly influenced by um, a Colleen Aimshida or um, I suppose th this mightn't be the correct term to use, but a servant girl in those days, a Colleen Aimshida, who was working in the house, and her name was Nora Neolaida. And Bess got loads of songs from this young woman. And she was also a brilliant, uh, brilliant lilter and used to lilt for dancers in the area. Um, and so there's this real wealth of um, uh, practices among women that possibly you know, we don't know about or we don't focus on or aren't celebrated in the same way as perhaps performers in professional spheres nowadays. Um, in my work recently, so I've been really, really interested in these practices um, that I have termed socially embedded creative practices. Um, so I'm fascinated by these because of how the skills are assimilated. Often it's in a, in a highly immersive context. It's a sort of a learning through the creative practice itself. Um, so these singers typically weren't schooled formally. Um, they weren't taken aside to be taught song per se, uh, but they were immersed in constant singing. As Brown Donald Mabagoyne would have said about 19th century Ireland that there was singing literally from the cradle to the grave. It was so um, pervasive. And I'm fascinated by this context of singing and lilting and dancing in particular. Um, and in my own playing, um, the whistle would be uh, my first instrument. My father's a whistle player as well. So I would have been listening to the whistle since I was very small. Uh, but I was also taught by Bobby Gardner in Valley Duff Upper in County Waterford, a place that Mel Mercier would know well, of course. Um, and I also used to dance in that region as well. And it's, it's all polkas. Um, in, in, in the local sets in Ballyduff. They don't have any slides at all. Um, and so I, um, I suppose when I was younger, um, even though I used to be dancing sets, possibly I, I wasn't as fanatical about polkas as I am today. Some people might say it's a condition, you know, at some point in your life that you become fanatical about polkas. At the moment, I kind of feel if there was going to be one tune type left in the world, I probably would um would go for the polka uh, just because of of how it how um it flows through your body the way it kind of takes you over as 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 a tune type 
Um, and so today I'm just going to talk about some of my thoughts on polkas. So philosophizing on polkas for the first part of this talk. Um, and particularly I'm interested in the singability of polkas um, and the, the, how vernacular technique is, is generated per se. Um, because I suppose maybe over the past 10 years, um, when I really would have got very much into to polka and slide playing, but particularly polkas, as I say, um, the, there is a lyricism to polka playing that I find really striking, you know, from somebody who comes from a singing background. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of the ornaments that you get in air playing, um, as in very traditional air playing, you know, based on song, and those song ornaments, um, you often find those kind of singable uh, ornaments in polka playing as well, which I'm particularly interested in. But then as well, I'm also interested of um, the knowledge that comes from dancing feet and then maybe comes back into our creative practice in other ways. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about orality and embodiment. Um, and even though we often talk about Irish traditional music as an oral tradition, of course, that orality also includes the knowledge of the body. It's not simply that which is verbal, you know, so a narrow reading of what orality means, I don't think really would encompass the creative practices or the vernacular creative practices that, that you would find um, in traditional communities, um, for example. So these socially embedded creative practices are interesting because of their invisibility. Um, often people would say, well, that's an amazing singer. Um, and you don't often think, you know, is it a gift from God? Or there's there's often this, this focus on it being kind of, um, you know, it being a gift bestowed from elsewhere um, because it's so amazing. Um, but my own opinion on it would be um, that really there are amazing um, artistic skills developed through immersion alone. Um, similar to how we all learned our mother tongue um, or our mother tongues, depending on, on one's background, um, our, our mammies didn't have to open a grammar book next to our cribs so that we would learn to master our mother tongue. And there's an interesting kind of linguistic uh, like cognition, I think, to the development of vernacular practices in that sense. Um, these are really challenging, however, because they're invisible. Um, they're not accompanied by um, a vernacular written theory of music, for example. So when we talk about theorizing traditional music or uh, maybe building uh, a traditional music theory, you know, we're drawing from Western notational practices. And some of that is incredibly useful and particularly in my earlier work, um, I used to transcribe Shano songs for fun um, and, and used to play with those forms and the elasticity of, of, of those forms. Um, but my feeling on transcription was, even though it's something I do and I like, um, in many ways, it can never be more than just a scribble. Um, and it can, be, it can be a really inaccurate sketch, especially when it comes to, to free rhythm. Um, and so I think that we have to look elsewhere for this concept of traditional music theory. And to me, um, that theory is an embodied theory. That theory often doesn't even have any words attached to it. It's not verbalized. Um, and what I believe instead is that the experience of dance, for example, and the embodied knowledge that that gives us in how we articulate polkas and slides, for example, just to, to focus on that, being a Cork woman, um, that um, that embodied knowledge um, can actually come out in the playing. And it's not something that's formally taught and it hasn't really been documented, but it exists nonetheless. At the same time, then we have a really pervasive vocal tradition. Lilting, of course, uh, is something that has become a lot less common nowadays, but also is, is equally influential. So. Um, these socially embedded creative practices are complex and interlocking. The domestic is a really important context for them. The community also, um, they're nonverbal and they're really sophisticated conceptually, even though we may not be able to put them into words. And they constitute a sort of an ecosystem of musical, rhythmic, poetic ideas that kind of exist in an interlocking way. 
Um, so there's a saying in Irish anyway, you know, if there's if there's um if you see a really good dancer, you'd say, well talk kills na cosa a geshud nu a kishud, um, that they have music in their feet. That's a massive compliment for a dancer in Irish. Um, but it's also, I think, tells us something important conceptually as well, uh, that Kjol's Nakosa is embodied music. And that's something that seems to be key to uh, the conceptual world of, of traditional music, including, of course, people listening to dancers on the radio as well. And the dancer having this, um, this instrument-like uh, status in some ways within, within the, the tradition. Um, so um, those are the things that um, I, I wanted to speak about. And um, just at this point, I would just like to, um, if I could ask um, you there to, to play one of the tracks that I sent earlier, it's entitled Polka and Dance G. And I just want to talk about this a little bit. Um, and this is a recording, I hope that it works. Um, and this recording uh, was something that I did just during the week in, in my own house, my daughter was visiting. And um, so I, I asked her just to, to dance some polka steps while I played. Um, and I simply just want for this to, to, to run so that we can listen to the interaction between the polka and, and it's a very rough recording and the steps. And I just wanted to mention that um, the steps that my daughter is dancing, she would have, like myself, would have learned her dancing in Ballet Duff, but she also would have been taught by um, John Lynch from Cleidach, better known as John the Leper, a, a legendary set dancer from the Cleidach region who um, improvises his steps. And so we'll hear some of that there. I hope the recording works if you have it there to hand. Is Nell there in the background? Yeah, Nell's just lining it up now. Oh, perfect. Sorry. I can't do that if she's sharing her screen. Sorry? I can't do it if she's sharing her screen. She has to stop sharing her screen. At the shop, she stop sharing the screen. Okay. Thanks a million for that, Nell. Um, so um, I hope that maybe you heard some of the play between um, the rhythm of Gorunda's feet and the playing. And also, um, you can also hear commonalities between the sort of ornamentation that would be used on the whistle when compared with the um, rhythmic motifs in, in the feet. Um, and just to explain that, Gorunla would never dance that the same way twice, really. Um, so it was just it was just something that we did for fun. But I hope that it gives a sense of um, the interlocking nature of of these two forms. And in my own playing, um, I don't think that it's possible for me to separate the dance from the tune, and nor would I want to. Um, and uh, so I think that there's something fundamental 
um, in the experience, the embodied experience of dance that feeds into creative practice in, in a really interesting way. Um, and of course, what's interesting about this is that that particular tune is also sung which is just interesting you have this corpus of highly singable polkas and i had a recording of goram the dancing to one but we don't have time to play that now so we won't do that um but there are lots of them such as um one that Bobby Gardner sings that um, people here will know well is, Oh, you stole my cups and saucers. You did you wrong, you did you wrong, you courted all my daughters. Says my hiding from Kipperland, died you the door, um, the idle door, um, till the day, dum, the idle door, um, dum, dum, the very idle day. And um, even in that, I can still feel the steps uh, in my body, even when I lilt it. And I suppose this began to influence uh, how I was conceptualizing um, traditional music and those forms. And in some ways that I think that the divide between dance and instrumental music and song can be a false divide and that they flow into each other in really interesting ways. And when it comes to issues of style then that rediscovering singability uh, is something that can um, regenerate uh, our own style um, and can underpin living vernacular ornaments um, uh, per se. Um, so I'm just going to go back to my um, my screen there just one second to the slides. Um, and would you believe Trina there's two minutes left thank you. Oh, <laughs> I won't go back at all so um, Okay, so um, that's fine. I'll, I'll finish up with that. So th this is an interesting topic as well, because um, I'll just sing a little bit of just one other song. Um, there's this really interesting elasticity um, in traditional music practices, um, especially when you go into the realm of song. So there's a very common tune called Tatter Jack Welsh. I'm just going to lilt because it's faster. Um, die the day, do the day, or dum the bidi, I the dum door, do the dum daddy, I the dum do the day, the bidi, da do the day, um, the bidi, do the day, I the day, day. That's how it goes. Um, but there's a song then, um, called Erhorin Huimala, which means on the border of Clamel. And, uh, so it, it's really kind of situated in the, the, um, where old Daisha Irish used to stretch way out of Waterford. So it's kind of that part of the world. Um, and it goes as follows. And just to give you a sense of there being a common melody to the tune, and then of course that tune becomes the song, because song composers typically would choose the tune first and then put the words to it. But what we find is a really interesting elasticity in the melodic structure um, and in the in the rhythmic structure, as in the melody doesn't stay the same. It will change according to the phrasing or the words or whatever the singer chooses to do at the time. Um, but also there's this incredible sense of stretch and how we would could ever possibly document that would be almost impossible. Um, you know, so I, I kind of feel that creative practice is the only way of knowing what the structure is and what it means. Um, I am at the point now where I believe that it's, it's really impossible to document it using notation or textual forms. And the only way to understand this sort of conceptual world is to experience it and to do it. 
Um, and so these are just some thoughts um, that tie, I suppose, scholarship and creative practice together. But more so, I suppose, what I've been talking about is how creative practice is fundamental in informing how we theorize um, about musical structure, um, about creative practice and about the traditions that we study and that there is no substitute for exploring it through practice itself. And so I hope that um, my talk today has given some insight into my own creative practice um, and into the connections that I see between lived creative practice and hidden domestic traditions of practice, um, vernacular technique, style and artistry, um, and how these hidden traditions uh, can be incredibly rich, even though typically they invariably fall outside of what we would uh, deem scholarship within universities, even though of course, that, that's, that's changing now and changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that uh, there's a challenge in creative practice also because um, the, the oral traditional practices really pose such a fundamental challenge to a textual authority. And through these hidden practices, we also find ways of listening again to hidden histories of thought um, and really interesting conceptual worlds that would have been practiced by women in domestic contexts. So I'm going to leave Great, it at that, and I'm sorry for going not, over. <laughs> you're not at all going over. It, you, you, you could just, it's just so amazing. And I'm, I, my, if I had a cup of coffee every morning and a lilt of you, all through COVID, I would have been sorted. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing energy coming off the screen there. So thank you so much. And just in relation to just some beautiful uh, words that you were talking about uh, in terms of um, just the, the sort of, I guess, the ineffability really of the embodied uh, knowledge. And it's just about the dancing through the feet, which is just a fantastic uh, a thing and the flow through your body as well, which is perhaps, again, is very, very important in relation to the session today. But as a nice sort of segue into Brian, I might also just, you talked quite a lot about the hidden and, um, and what is hidden and hidden histories of thought. And I think if we move on to Brian now, uh, Brian Fay, and uh, Brian's work very much encounters a lot of this through his practice. So if I could just very welcome Brian, first of all, and uh, just to say that uh, Brian is an artist and a senior lecturer in fine art at TU Dublin. Using drawing, he examines the materiality of pre-existing artwork and objects to consider a complex relationship in time. He exhibits nationally and internationally and has been invited uh, to attend the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation Redsea program in 2022. Brian was the winner of the Derwent International Drawing Prize in 2014. His work features in many uh, national collections. And just to tell everyone, he has a new exhibition opening, A Mobile Living Thing, on this, this Saturday. Is it actually this Saturday? No, it's Saturday week, Saturday, 2nd of October at the DLR Lexicon Municipal Gallery, Dublin. So um, it's just a lovely thing to be able to, to hear Brian and then perhaps have the possibility to uh, to see his work as well. So thank you, Brian. Thank you, Belinda. I hope people can see the, the first slide on the PowerPoint presentation there. Um, if so, um, I just want to thank everybody. Thank uh, Belinda, Mel and Orla and Orla Limbas for the very kind and generous invitation. It's really lovely to find a forum where different disciplines and activities can come together and reflect really on the commonality and the shared dilemmas and um, uh, issues that we all face. It, it's, it's really, really uh, rich and re uh, rewarding and insightful. So thank you so much. That was a real first takeaway I had. The second thing was, and again, acknowledging what Trina was saying about the notion of um, the immersion in singing and the emergent voice, I just still wish I could sing like that. So with my own uh, voice as such as it is, I thought I would, um, for this presentation, consider the idea of um, where does research reside and what levels of disclosure are necessary for research 
within two contexts. And uh, the first context I was going to look at was through my own experience of having done um, a practice based PhD uh, finishing in 2014, but the scars are still raw and um, my own practice since then. And maybe to think around those sort of competing ideas around the types of disclosure that can um, exist and coexist across both of those activities in an academic context and a non-academic context. And of course, um, I don't speak for all visual art practices when I'm, when I'm speaking here. And to be honest, I wouldn't even speak for all drawing practices, which is what my work has uh, result, uh, revolved around for a number of years. Rather, it's my own um, experience and findings and reading and research that, in, that inform this. So it's full of fallibility, it's full of subjectivity as well. But maybe that also speaks to issues around um, issues of objectivity and, and subjectivity. So I'm just going to quickly divide this um, uh, presentation into these four, four parts. And I am aware that each area of drawing and practice and theory and research, they're all hugely loaded. So what I'm going to discuss here is just via my own understanding and navigating that sort of contested terrain. And perhaps uh, each of us finds our own necessary purchase on that terminology that allows us to act off our instinct and allows us to act off our hunches to define the questions that we want to look at. I'm just reminded of Hilary Mantel's claim about historical facts that she says that while they're fixed, they're not stable. And I really like that idea that it's our interpretation that acts as our, our singular compass to help us explore these ideas of research and its relationship to, to practice. So in thinking around where does research reside, this presentation considers the visibility of disclosure and what that means for for some form of, of verification within an accessible um, context. And within a formal academic concept of practice-based or practice-led research. So perhaps within that, it's the notion of methodology that strengthens and gives us a, a scaffold or a platform around how we can use our research and how that integrates within the practice. So the methodology supports visibility. And in this way, methodology should be apparent and available. And perhaps when it comes to a practice outside of an exam context, that that can be less visible. It's not to say that it isn't there. Maybe going back to Belinda's idea of the, of the hidden, perhaps the research and its embedding and embodiment within a creative output is tacit. Maybe it's intuitive and maybe it's marinated and embedded in the outcome, in the artistic outcome. And I do acknowledge that, you know, there can be a simple binary in that, oh, you know, forms of research speak to objectivity and forms of creative practice speak to subjectivity. So I, I'm taking it that we're not working with that and that th th there's, there's an equal acknowledgement of how each context really operates in this wildly, beautifully plural and porous manner. So those definitions, Mantel's, they're, 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 they're not stable. And it's perhaps the fact that they're not stable is the thing that allows creative practitioners to engage within structuring methodologies that make sense to capture uh, the trajectory of a creative practice. Similarly, Palmer here speaks about this idea. It's a kind of mutual exchange. It's a shared set of enterprises. And what I like about this definition here is that it doesn't set up a hierarchy which sometimes for those of us maybe working within an academic context, I think as Trina mentioned earlier, there can be the notion of the, 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 the square peg um, of the practitioner coming in. Um, so therefore there's research at the top and practice somewhere down the pecking order. But I think we should be emboldened. And I think we should take that, that, that claim of so much of what was happening within creative practice um, can be looked at through the lens of research. It doesn't have to bend itself to fit into, into research. And I also just want to talk about drawing very, very, very briefly. Um, as, as the wonderful South American artist Lewis Kamnister said, it is really quite sad that we're restricted to one word for all the versions of drawing that there is. And what I want to do is, while acknowledging what Kamnister says, just to maybe look at two properties of drawing. Drawing that acts as a form of research and drawing that is informed by research. 
So for example, a drawing as research could go back historically to the idea of the observational drawing or the working drawing towards a building or the working plan towards a piece of engineering so that you're thinking through drawing for a future projected outcome. And then maybe this drawing informed by research, which is perhaps where my own work sits in, that it exists or responds to a pre-existing artwork or object or um, like maybe Wayne's piece, a thing or an object. And these are standard definitions, obviously, within sort of um, our practice around primary, secondary and, and material uh, forms of research. And I think most importantly as well is that it's the explorative potential of the material as well that we listen to, be that be a voice, be that be an existing tradition, or be that be to a piece of music that we have found that we re reinterpret. Similarly, the idea of drawing as research can be performative and experiential. As Patricia Kane, the artist points out, she says that it can operate, a drawing can operate as embodied thinking as a method of knowledge, a constitution uh, that takes place within the drawing process. And while I acknowledge that my own work is maybe in the latter category informed by research, and it builds on pre-existing artworks or objects, and particularly on their, on their care and conservation, thereby requiring these three stages of primary, secondary, and material in, in engagement. And all this is with a view to bringing across our attention to ideas of time and duration that are shown through art objects, but maybe make us reflect back on our own recent experience and our own personal experience of duration. Um, and historically, of course, these three methods and classifications here are embedded in multiple forms of drawing and porously cross over to drawing um, as they do for research, which I think is an important point. Drawing somehow also is lower ranking in the hierarchy of art practices, which, which I kind of enjoy. And I argue that it's part of its strength as the fact that no one discipline has a kind of clear purchase on drawing, even if we think about the notion of notation that was mentioned earlier, in the way that perhaps a painting has a purchase ontologically in relation to fine art practice. And that said, perhaps it's that malleability and the fecundity that makes drawing hard to function um, as one might like it to within a, a, a research context. And as Naginsky here argues that it's something around this notion of the unanticipated way that gives us that creative impetus. And for me, it's the acceptance and learning from the unanticipated that is a strength um, that happens within a practice, be that through formal or uh, informal frameworks. Sorry, I beg your pardon. So I just want to give some brief examples of uh, some of my work. For the PhD, I concentrated on the works of Vermeer, um, uh, 17th century Dutch artist. Um, there's thought to be between 35 and 37 of his works in, in existence. I got drawn to him because of ideas of timelessness that are associated with his work. And um, the fact that because they are so rare and they have a, a sort of museum trophy status, that there's a huge amount of technical examination of x-rays and infrareds and, and technical art historical actions take place on them. And the fact that he didn't supposedly use drawing when he died in the inventory of a studio, there were no drawings found, which is quite unusual for an art practice at the time. So there's something around the conceit of transferring or translating these paintings Back into, back into drawings. It's, it's uh, upsetting the normal rhythm. So my research led me to look at technical uh, bulletins and examinations I came across in the National Gallery of Ireland through field research. Um, a wonderful piece on um, the love letter, um, which was stolen in 19, the early 1970s, really badly damaged, as you can see here, cut down from the stretcher, found uh, uh, a few weeks later, it was part of a political protest at the time, and then the decision was made is how do we restore this? So decision was made to illusionistically restore the painting. So when you go to see the painting now, as it was in Dublin in 2017, you would have no idea necessarily of the history of the painting. So I got really interested in the idea about what is hidden and who gets to decide what we, we see, what historical events remain visible and what remain hidden. So in this case, I did a one-to-one -one drawing of the um, love letter and then enacted ideas of time around it. These are all the, the um, cracks that appeared on the surface of the painting, uh, drew those and then drew them onto the surface of my drawing. And then 
erased the areas that were damaged by the, um, the theft. And then like the conservator, sort of as faithfully as I could, redrew them back in. So in, in effect, you just at the end have what looks like a copy of a, a painting, but is in, but is in fact a, a record or an action trying to highlight the idea of the different areas of damage that happened through that. And that was all based on desk research, field research, material research, observational research, all around how I could mimetically and illusionistically and as accurately as I was able to do to reproduce the painting. And similarly, that um, exploration worked with this um, small painting, which may or may not be by Vermeer, Girl with the Red Hat. When x-rays were taking place on that, I hope you can see um, there, it's made up of a series of small plates. When you turn it upside down, if you shift your head for a sec, you might see there's a hat, the outline of a, of a hat, and it's a man's hat. So in this case, the artist, maybe Vermeer, uh, worked over the same painting. I like the idea of trying to make some uh, way or that we would encounter the painting at the same time, make the x-ray the same as the, as make the underpainting the same as the overpainting. So try to subvert ideas of, of time and our experience of time. And what that led me to do was to um, frame the piece. So the two drawings I hope you can see are there. One, one was drawn upside down and the other is drawn the right way up in terms of the x-ray. And then on one side, the, the frame comes out perpendicular to the wall. One image is on one side, one image is on the other. So you can't see both images at the same time. So something around memory and movement was the idea of, of tracing that out. So that was all under the rubric of like a practice-led, practice-based research. And I found things like McNamara uh, really useful in this. He says, good practice-led research is a complicated affair necessitating a complex back and forth interaction between the practice and its conceptual framework or articulation. Each component, the creative practice and the exegetical research framework is capable of producing knowledge. So in my own work, that visibility of the intention within the framework for practice led PhD sought to use research methods that I could scaffold around that to make visible things that were happening in the, in the, in the practice. And some of that was captured in what Rubrich was pointing to, that it is okay for us to work off, and I quote here, um, an artistic hunch an intuition or question or an artistic or technical concern generated by the researcher's own practice, which has, uh, which it has become important to pursue in order to continue that practice. And in a sense, that's what those pieces did and they operated within an emergent framework of acknowledging value of research, recognizing the value of intuition, accepting subjectivity and reflexivity and allowing findings and practice to be negotiated. So trying to bypass that binary of um, objectivity and subjectivity. I could literally just end the talk here now, I think, because David Shrigley just says this really, really well. And perhaps as artists, we don't need to open that out and, and to explain it. But having gone through a kind of PhD process, which some of the other speakers have, or, 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 or a period of a sort of interrogation around oneself as, as, as an artist, those things become embedded and embodied uh, within it. And I think, you know, even, even with Shrigley and accounting for, for for, for Shrigley, there's something around how you can account or give a framework or a specific form of attention for an audience or a marker or maker or reader, that there is that little onus there, I think, to, to help people, to people in, to help people in. And I think as well too, this particular drawing spoke to me when I got out of the PhD, I just wanted a freedom and non-accountability and, um, and a sense of space emerged for me from this. So I did the radical action of switching from Vermeer to Rembrandt, but I began to ch explore size and scale, um, thinking of my own body and reproducing these X-ray drawings on a one-to-one -one scale. Again, this is from an image of a, of a, of a piece of an X-ray under a large equestrian portrait by Rembrandt. When I thought I had got work through Vermeer, I got an invitation to the National Gallery to respond to um, the, the show that was on there in 2017. So I created these seven small works. Some were just crap drawings alone from the lace maker and the, the, the guitar player. And in other ones, I began to open up my own research methods. Um, to, so I hope you can see the kind of one-to-one -one scale of the lace maker and the drawing that took place off that. And then I began to look at Vermeer and his maps and I traced, I got access, I researched the maps that appeared in the back of his paintings. And then I literally just mapped the trajectory and the history of where that painting had traveled since it left Vermeer's studio 
onto that map and then remove the map. So you're left with this series of sort of geometric lines, but I'm not necessarily giving the viewer that sense of, of what that process or that, that sort of conceptual framework or scaffold was for it. Rather, maybe it's about its relationship to the other works that were there. Similarly, um, mischievousness, I think, shouldn't be um, uh, uh, neglected in terms of why and how we make things and account for things. And this was a famous drawing by Robert Rauschenberg's A Raised to Kooning. People with from fine art background or art history will, will be aware of this. So Rauschenberg erased de Kooning's drawing and um, presented it as a supposedly blank sheet of paper. Obviously, it's not blank. But through the infra, uh, infrared examination, the, the de Kooning's trace of de Kooning's drawing was there. And they also discovered a de Kooning drawing on the back of the paper. And then I compiled both those drawings and compressed them into one singular time. And again, that was without a, a kind of formal constraint or um, examination being brought to place. Belinda kindly mentioned the uh, work that I have coming up. And I just want to talk about briefly the idea of field research being, being so important. I, this show is about responding to four small paintings by the Irish artist Mani Jellet, small um, uh, works on paper. Um, and I had examined those tiny little dots on, 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 the, on the paper of damage. And I met the conservator and I spoke with him and asked him why and or, or the wherefores. I researched Jellet's family. Her uncle was a physicist, George Francis Fitzgerald, who was responsible for ideas of contesting ideas of the ether, which led to Einstein's theory of um, relativity and changing of time. So I developed these small drawings based on the little spots that appeared on Jellet's little paintings and made them almost like astrological things across a series of nine drawings and used her uh, cubist um, action of rotation and translation to make that happen. So there was quite a sort of cerebral or conceptual engagement. And then by chance, I got access to her studio. And I began to think around not just the, the, the astronomical time of, of the work or the, the artistic time and the entropy of the work, but to think about the time and the biographical um, nature of, of, of the artists themselves. So that led me Sorry, to- Brian, if you just have a, just another minute, please, right. thank you. That led me to just working on these sort of more uh, drawings that are based on Jellet, which have broken up the space. And um, uh, uh, in this one, again, playing with scale, and it's again, based on tiny images, uh, tiny dots that appeared on the surface of, of, of her work and looking at her cubist breakdown to, to, to frame these pieces. So in a sense, that's how the research played in. I was just taken very briefly by a conference that took place in January talking about a post-research context for artistic practice um, and it problematizes ideas of artistic research not being able to deal with ideas of creative innovation, disciplinary knowledge production or political activism. I think that would be a very interesting conversation to sort of take place and just in conclusion I think it's important to recognize that the artwork is not an illustration of the research rather it's something that might emerge from the context of that research. The artistic outcome is not necessarily about research, rather it is from research. So in this way, the place is always there despite levels of disclosure that it's necessary within different frameworks for, for artworks to be speculative, iterative, curious, hunch, open-ended and non-linear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, really, really fascinating. And again, it's just it just feels like it's we're just flying through them. There's there's such a short space of time uh, uh, to talk about such a breadth of practice and actually the forensic nature that you go through, the forensic nature of examining the work, but also the forensic nature of your own practice. And I think perhaps if so far it's it's sort of for me sort of quite a a deep and profound. Uh, practice uh, with Trina and yourself in, in, in sort of this uh, embodiment of, of taking the responsibility of this work and uh, embodying it obviously through yourself, but also uh, to whether it is uh, going out into, I guess, really a larger world. Um, for example, in your case, Brian, through exhibition as well. So I, I might come back to that. Um, in a little while, but I also really enjoyed your outsider nature of drawing. And actually, if you know the art world, you would very much know uh, that poor drawing is, is sort of down at the bottom of the echelons of, uh, let's say, actually financial value uh, you would put, as well as a throwaway value, you know, that, you know, you might save 
on a very very personal way you might save let's say a drawing from your daughter but you won't you know but you know you might not say you might just it might just be in a little bit of paper but drawing itself is such a, a thing you throw away and it's just fantastic that just to hear uh the, the, the punk as well coming back into it brian and saying yeah it's just, you know drawing yeah you know let's get to it you know and uh it, again brian has really uh not done himself justice i think to the sense of the breadth and skill of his work so again if you are available to go to the lexicon gallery and see the absolute detail and precision that he puts in the work i strongly um, recommend it and finally, if I just move on then to our last presentation of the session, uh, which is Danny McCarthy. Uh, Danny studied at the National College of Arts and Design and currently lectures in sound art at the School of Music and Drama in UCC. Uh, he is the fundamental pioneer and I can't underestimate that point, uh, you know, enough in terms of the landscape of the sound landscape in Ireland and the amount of work that he has pioneered in both performance and sound art, but also in being a major impetus and focus for founding amazing organizations, experimental organizations at the time, such as Triscoll Art Centre and the National Sculpture Factor. And he has also represented Ireland in many international sonic and uh, art exhibitions. And also, just to plug for Danny as well, I just got my uh, email in from PowerPoint Recordings, Danny, and uh, just saying that you have just released a beautiful looking um, edition, a tape edition of the telepathic lockdown tapes on Farpoint Records, which I believe is available on Bandcamp on Farpoint site. So congratulations to Sunny Dash now. And thank you again for presenting with us. If you could just unmute yourself, Danny, there, please. Apologies for that. Um, Okay, can you hear me now and see that image on the screen? Uh, we just see your face there, Donny. Okay. Now, can you Can you see the image and hear me? Perfect, perfect. Okay, thank you. And thanks for, thanks for those kind, kind words. I'm really honored to be in such esteemed company and humbled as well. And I don't normally do this type of thing, but uh, Mel Mercer, who's got a very persuasive personality, as most people will, will know, and he persuaded me to do it. Um, the first piece I'm going to talk about is a piece called Echoes from an Abandoned Schoolhouse. And it came about um, a long, long time ago um, when the Sculpture Society of Ireland organized an international exhibition of sculpture in the, the grounds of Ratvarnham Park. And this was an open submission competition that you could apply for. And uh, I spotted that um, Patrick Pierce's school was there in the grounds of that. And it was the, um, also a museum uh, to the school. And uh, I decided I'd apply to um, do a piece, a sound piece in the, the school. And sub submitting, I was submitting to a bunch of sculptors. There were artists definitely, but at the time sound art would not have been heard of at all at all. So I had no way of, and I didn't have the language myself either, uh, of applying for it. So I basically made up a small artist book outlining what I wanted to do. And then um, I submitted that and luckily they accepted the work. I wanted to talk about Pierce as an educationalist. I didn't know an awful lot about him at the time. And then um, I just knew he had written a book called The uh, Murder Machine and he had founded a school and that. So I submitted a rough idea of what I wanted to do, and then the research following into it came, came about. Um, interestingly, I kind of discovered lots of uh, little asides from him because I certainly only knew him for the, the blood sacrifice and things like that, and most people only knew him for that as well. But his theories on education and his study of education were really quite fascinating. Like, I mean, he was teaching typing to boys in 1913 which is, I still think it's, it's quite fascinating, even though people don't type anymore in the traditional way of typing and that. So I set about um, creating a work to be installed in the school. 
a kind of a interesting aside for that as well, because my first time in a, what I call a real recording studio. And then um, at the time, to give you some kind of concept of what that was like, the mixing desk would take up half of most people's sitting room, the size of it now, which would now fit on your, your telephone, you know, so it was a, a bit overall seeing all these knobs and things like that in front of you and not knowing what they did. But luckily at the time in Trista, where I had been doing some experimental sound work, the sound engineer there owned the recording studio and I was happy to, to work with him. But arriving in the studio on the day that we decided to, to do something, uh, he was missing and he had um, someone else standing in who happened to be one of Ireland's leading songwriters. Um, and, but as a sound engineer, only knew guitar, bass and drums like a lot of sound engineers at the time, or most sound engineers at the time did. So I had to try and persuade him to do what I wanted to do and that I had voices on top of each other and things like that. And you couldn't make out what they were saying, but I wanted that to happen. And then anyway, we worked away and got on, on quite well. And the, the whole idea then was that I would install this recorded piece in the uh, foyer and in some of the rooms in St. Enda's, the Baldwin Pierce's school. Now the speakers wouldn't be visible and the sound would be relatively low, but quite audible. And in a sense, almost like ghost voices or that what you were hearing was happening in the next room. And uh, I was setting up the speakers anyway at this stage and then um, working on it and next thing I heard these um, voices of kids and I said oh my god here's the school tour now the last thing I want happening when I'm in the middle of setting something up only to discover that um, it was actually I'd left my my tape running and that was me so I made a fool of myself and I said well at least I know the piece is working the way I want it to, to do now and a similar thing happened to me much more recently when I was setting up an installation in Sirius in Cove, and I was setting up um, a piece to commemorate the sinking of the Lusitania. And one of the tracks on it was called Stone Cutter's Blues or Stone Carver's Blues, which was playing with the sound of a stone carver. And I was hanging up the speaker on the wall and next thing I heard the, the sounds and I said, feck it, I must have left that turned on. And looked around and just further down the road, there was a man carving a name on the front of a house. So um, that uh, made me again realize that the piece was beginning to work. So the, um, as I said, the idea then was that the sound was going to be um, hidden behind pictures on, the, pictures on the wall. That's the front of the building there. So it was kind of quite imposing. Uh, you're coming up at the time from Cork, you haven't seen the space before. You've had a rough idea of one of the pictures and that. But um, we managed to install the, the work and you know, there was sound coming from the desks and things like that. I just play a bit of the sound of ice were flicking through these pictures. And again, listening to the sound of that at the time, before I turned it on, uh, a lot of it you couldn't do nowadays because um, I'd got a friend of mine who was a teacher to go into the classroom or to use his classroom and record the kids in the classroom and to get them say particular poems and songs and that. And it was almost like a day in the life of a school in a sense, but I mean, I couldn't go into a school now without so much clearance and whatever and uh, record the kids and then you'd have to get permission from them to use their voices and things like that. At the time, uh, none of that existed, you know, so um, kind of, this is how the, the piece starts then. The great enemy of practical Christianity has always been respectable society. Respectable society has now been reinforced by 
political economy. I feel sure that political economy was invented not by Adam Smith, but by the devil. Perhaps Adam Smith was the human instrument of whom that wily one made use, even as he made use of the elder Adam to pervert men to the ways of respectability. Be certain that in political economy there is no way of life, either for a man or for a people. Life for both is a matter not of conflicting tariffs, but of conflicting powers of good and evil. And what have Ricard and Malthus and Stuart Mill to teach about this? Ye men and peoples, burn your books on rent theories and land values and go back to your sagas. If you will not go back to your sagas, your sagas will come to you again in new guise, for they are terrible, immortal things, not capable of being put down by respectable society or by political economy. The old truths will find new mouths, the old sorrows and ecstasies new interpretation. Beauty is the garment of truth, or perhaps we should put it that beauty is the substance in which truth bodies itself forth. And then we can... Nothing has given me greater pleasure during the past session than to watch Skull Eana developing as it has been doing on the athletic side. Our boys must now be amongst the best hurlers and footballers in Ireland. Wellington was credited with the dictum that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. I am certain that when it comes to a question of Ireland winning battles, her main reliance must be on her hurlers. To your commands, O oh boys of Banva. So that's kind of some, some of the, the soundtrack of it. I hadn't listened to it then for a long, long time until Farpoint were doing the book on me, and then I did a kind of an abridged version of it. But in turn, that research on that piece led me on to uh, another piece, which came up um, for the 216, 2016 commemoration of 1916, when we was invited to um, present a performance piece in the in Kilmainham Jail. It was a, a show called Future Histories and was curated by Anya Phillips. So they invited me to, to do a piece for it. And then um, I had pre previously done some stuff in Kilmainham Jail on Robert Emmett and things like that. But um, I decided to do a, a reworked version of the, the original Echoes from the Abandoned Schoolhouse soundtrack. And um, I went back and listened to the soundtrack of it. and decided that you know 20 years on I was still happy with it and I didn't want to change it um, except uh, at times when um, I was using the, the typewriter and the, and the thing I had it mic'd up with contact mics and things like that so you got a harsh noise concert in the middle of the the, the quieter sound thing so I basically got a, a cell that had been used by Padre Pierce at the time as well and then um, I set up an installation within it um, and sat at the at the desk for eight hours. Sometimes I moved around the, the building, but the idea was again just the whole his theories on education. Like he did, he didn't believe in corporal punishment, which is only something that again we've recently kind of woke up. He inherently didn't believe there was anything like um, that boys were bad and things like that. Uh, a bold, um, like he couldn't get over one day when a, a boy stole a slice of cake. And uh, he couldn't figure it out because the boy had free access to the kitchen and could have taken the whole cake rather than just a slice. But um, that's just part of his things. So that's basically what the installation looked like. Me sitting in the cell, the speakers behind me making the sound and various drawings and things like that on the wall on little blackboards. Yeah. As I say, it was a performance piece, so the physical presence within the space was, was quite important and without the space that they, they all interrelated together. 
that's what it looked like from the from the outside. You kind of just came across that there wasn't any sign outside or anything like that. And at the same time, there was lots of other performances going on within the building, up and down the stairs and things like that. And the main soundtrack was about 20 minutes loop of the original uh, It Goes From an Abandoned Schoolhouse piece in it with harsh noise concert on the typewriter whenever I felt like um, doing that. What was interesting for me up in a point, and it was like how I was still happy with a piece of work that I had created 20 years previously on uh, antiquated, which are now antiquated or machines and whatever. Like, I mean, you had none of your handheld Zoom recorders going around doing any of that work in the schoolhouse and that kind of thing. That was all done on, on cassette players because of this. there wasn't any other methods or there any other methods weren't affordable or available to us. Next piece. That then led on to um, another piece that took place the same year, um, 2016, a piece that took place in Triscoll Art Centre. Again, I was invited, got a commission to do a commemorative piece for 1916. And then um, I um, thought about it and was wondering what I was going to do with it. And then um, in the meantime, we got a, an invitation to go to the Rauschenberg Foundation in Florida and do a residency there. So the one thing I had in my head going there was to make the work for the 1916 piece in Driscoll, which was called, um, well, firstly, the last piece was called Retyping the Typecast, because I believe Paul Pierce is really typecast. So this was Retyping the Typecast. And this piece for Driscoll is called Rewriting History, a Sonic Opera. So what I decided to do for it was to do a series of mesostics, which is a method I use quite a, quite a bit. And I, uh, I first came across it coming from Cage. Um, I don't know if well, there's bound to be someone out there who doesn't know what a mesostic is, but almost everyone knows what an acrostic is, which is really putting a word down the side of a page and the sentences flowing out from that. A mesostic is where the word runs down the center of the page and the other words are on either side of that particular word. So in this in this case, I took the, the proclamation from 1916, I took the names of each of the signatories and wrote a series of uh, seven, mes seven mesostics or seven series of mesostics based on the names of each of the, um, the, the signatories. So then I had seven series there. So what I decided to do then was um, get uh, seven people to, to read those and to work with, with within them. Um, I decided to do uh, three women and three men equalizing things and then using a child to uh, outline the, the, the future as such. And the, the voices I used were um, Vicky Langan, who's a friend of mine, and she brought in her daughter, Shanuk, uh, Joan McCarthy, Irene Murphy, then my granddaughter, Sophie, who was six at the time and was rather hesitant about doing it, but... Um, and was giving out that it wasn't good enough, but I mean, what she did was really quite beautiful because she just got the text and tried to read it. Some of the words were too big for her and whatever, but she stumbled over them and managed to make them. Then I had Bernard Clark, Tony Sheehan and Ronald McCarthy. But an interesting thing again for me was when uh, I came back to Triscoll to about two months prior to the dates for the exhibition and wanted to talk about setting it up and that. And my whole idea was that I would, the piece would come out on the Tannoy system all over the, the building in Triscoll, but and um, I didn't quite realize that the Tenai system extended into the offices and extended into various other places, like the, the restaurant and that, and that it couldn't be isolated. So I suddenly couldn't use the work that way. I mean, I thought I could turn off the song onto the cafe and that, but no, the whole thing was hardwired the whole way around. I couldn't do it. So we had to come up with a, another idea. So I came up with this idea of, um, these speakers I had been collecting and um, over the years and um, purely because of their visual and oral qualities, uh, putting them on the steps inside in the, the church in Tristan. I guess it was in Christ Church, which is a rather huge building, as many of you will know. Uh, it's just basically a deconsecrated church that uses the concert hall now. 
so I put the speakers on the um, on the ground and that and did a drawing drawing basically I call it an audio drawing with the wires and things like that on the floor but the the sound then would move around the speakers and was totally indeterminate so in other words, I didn't know what it was going to sound at at any one time. I didn't know whose voice was going to be sounding. I didn't know if the seven voices were going to sound together or whether one voice would sound and or whether no voice would sound because there were silences built into all the tracks as well. And it was totally indeterminate. And so I'll just play you a, a little bit of that and show you some slides at the same time. freedom to read whatever way they wanted to read and then um, like for example Vicky decided to have her daughter reading with her at the same time and made a creative practice out of it and my other friend Irene Murphy she decided to read the whole thing backwards and uh, we used that voice as well and um, just wanted to stop here at this picture because it was interesting what Brian said about um, Rauschenberg and his erase, erase de Kooning like where we were when I was making this work was in Robert Rauschenberg's foundation in Captiva in Florida. And then um, again, I was influenced by that piece because that piece of the erased, the Kooning drawing is literally worth millions and millions at, at this stage. Like, and I never realized that Rauschenberg had been as rich as he was rich because where we were staying like was incredible. He had something like 20 houses of, in the middle of the island and things like that. But I did a piece in, in homage to his erased Kooning drawing. I did uh, three paintings uh, which erased the proclamation uh, by paint, painting over the proclamation, one in green, one in white and one in uh, orange. So it's interesting that, we, that that cropped up in, in both, our, both our talks. I'll just play on some more of this now and do some slides as well. Danny, we're just running over slightly. Irish Revolutionary Irish Republican Irish Republican Irish Republican that you had there making no sense is it being read backwards by Irene Murphy which fits into the piece as far as I was concerned really well some of those texts or drawings that you saw there were text scores that I made again, using the proclamation and 
uh, collaging it and things like that. So that's basically me finished. Thank you. Oh, thanks a million, Tommy. Um, it sort of it sort of brings us almost like a uh, full circle, I think, in a way, uh, in looking at the artist and in looking at the sense of practice. And sometimes I was looking at how you called your talk. You called it re research and and going back to the beginning and how we might revisit. Um, sites of significance and as as well as um, as well as like I guess in Trina's case it might be actually a particular tune that you might uh, revisit and uh, and 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 research in different ways I mean just even listening to you uh, first lilt a song and then hearing that uh, played by Whistle and your daughter uh, doing that and and how we might revisit that practice so if, if you wouldn't mind, I might just throw just a very general question, if I can, out, first of all, before we get into the chat, just to uh, just so giving us time to sort of look through and see what's happening, uh, just to talk about that process of perhaps uh, revisiting and perhaps rediscovering the hidden uh, within your practices, if that's OK. Trina, I might just throw that at you, if that's OK, first. No problem at all, Linda. Thank you for that. And also just to thank Brian and Danny for absolutely amazing um, uh, presentations, just utterly brilliant. Um, but yeah, so um, it's an interesting thing when it comes to oral tradition, because the oral tradition in Ireland, say, would be very old. We don't know quite how old, which is the thing about it. And it tends to, it's, it's inherently recreative. So it can be very old, but it's always tied to a sense of the contemporary. Um, so, you know, if we look to women poet composers in the 19th century, such as Maud of We, um, we see them uh, using much older themes, vision themes, traditions of prophecy. Um, and then there would be um, classical themes as well, which would have been borrowed from various places. And, and these are then recreated with a distinctly contemporary political voice uh, for the time. So it's kind of a paradox of orality that it can be ancient, but it will invariably be contemporary um, all the time. And so um, I think that this question of researching is, is definitely an apt way of describing what I do in my own work as well, because you're rediscovering or you're hearing things anew. And um, in my own practice, I suppose, I'm very interested in um, traditional creative practices that at this stage are off the beaten track a little bit, or they mightn't be what people are looking at, or you might find them in places that aren't necessar necessarily celebrated by official society. Um, and so there's a question of finding those places that are maybe not, not so well uh, populated and, and uh, finding the beauty uh, in 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 those, um, but also I think it can be it can be really radical uh, when you if you see things through new eyes or you hear them through new ears um, that it can really unsettle uh, how we understand uh, the history of thought, particularly in Ireland. I'm not sure I've answered your question, Belinda. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's certainly a start anyway. And just while we have you on, I just think Kevin has a, a question there for you from the chat. Kevin, is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, Trina. Um... A question from Matthew Noon um, and um, saying that he says talking, li listening to you talking Lilt makes him think about Hall. something Hall inspired to was the creation of an arts practice research model which was particularly Irish and he wonders if you have any thoughts on what Irish arts practice research might uh, might embody drawing upon your experience. Thanks so much for that fascinating question. Um, Michal O'Sullivan's conceptualization of Irish traditional practices was particularly rich. Um, and he often referred to poetry as well. And um, recently I was looking into his MA thesis, which was on the songs of, of three Gaelic song poets, um, which was an incredible read. Um, and kind of gives, gives a particular insight into the development of his own theorization of, of creative practice. Um, and so I think that in relation to kind of Irish arts practice or a theory of Irish arts practice, Irishness is so diverse now, before I say anything about traditional arts, just to say that what Irishness is will be, you know, 
very um, inclusive. And so um, you will have diasporic communities that have um, their own oral traditions, for example, as you have near me here in Mitchellstown and Cork. Um, and you'll have this lovely diversity and richness now as part of that arts practice scene. Um, but even within that, I think that um, there are many uh, traditional arts, not necessarily just Irish traditional arts, um, and the knowledges that they generate and that they transmit really do live in practice itself. Um, when it comes to Irish traditional practices, this is something I'm actually particularly interested in. In, in many ways, I think that when it comes to music education, um, looking outwards towards the field or bypassing what we, we used to know as music education might be something that's really important for the traditional arts. So for example, that a person coming into a classroom who might have a song from an uncle at home um, will understand the value of that. Um, but also that through the practice themselves that they, they, they inhabit a theoretical world as it were. Um, and interestingly, the question is interesting because I was recently in UCC and moved to Maynooth recently, but I had created a module in which students, all students would have been dancing as part of how they were learning about the, uh, the history and traditions of polkas and slides. Um, and so that's something that I try to do in my own teaching. Uh, even in my academic lectures, everybody sings, obviously curtailed by COVID-19 now, but you know, in principle. Um, and so in um, traditional culture at the moment, there has been, it has been a little bit schismatic in some ways as in sessions very, well, dancers are infrequently at sessions or part of sessions nowadays. I'm very worried, worried about the tradition of set dancing, uh, particular pol particularly polkas and slides. Um, the influence of competition kind of, again, has caused that to be put into another area and actually enabling this situation whereby you have, you know, vocal forms, dance forms, instrumental forms, mingling, I think is of huge importance. And um, without that, uh, we will begin to lose some of those older and, and enthralling aesthetic qualities, techniques and mm -hmm. approaches that, that used to be more widespread. Trina, can I just, I just want to bring in there, uh, Danny and Brian and you know, in some sense, I guess, just ask a very, very basic question as, as both artists. Um, in terms of your practices, I mean, Danny, you have a very, very deep listening practice and it involves actually great periods of um, isolation, uh, I presume within the work, although uh, noticing how much it was a family affair in, in some of those pieces and a friend's affair too. And Brian, uh, your forensic and uh, deep analysis of every, oh, every, every paint stroke and crack of, of the work. And it's not only, only paint, it's film as well that you involve in. I mean, these are very, um, one could say that they are quite insular processes. And, um, and what I was wondering was in a very, very basic way, and Trina, it's probably in relation as well to your practice too, is like, how much do you need a witness to your work? And, and how much, is there is how important it is to have a presence around your work uh, in 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 a particular time at a particular space. Danny, would you mind just approaching that? Because I'm thinking of your beautiful work there, uh, the Sonic Opera in Triscoll. Yeah, well, for, um, yeah. For, for me, um, space very often well will always influence the work, but sometimes can inspire the work. I mean, for example, the, the school to begin with, that was the genesis of the work, that building, the cell in Kilmainham was it, and then in Triscoll, which was nice in a sense that, um, because I believe every situation has creative potential. And because I couldn't do use the original uh, sound setup in Triscoll, I had to go and do something else. And I think the, the second work, or the, the work that was presented with it was much better and looked much better, sounded much better than what I intended to do initially. So it's, it's that um, opportunity of, of doing things like that and be, being, being open to chance. I mean, I also believe in the certainty of chance. I mean, that sound that you heard was just one section of it that I went in. I turned on the Zoom and let it left it there for 20 minutes. It wasn't pre-recorded or pre-edited in the studio or anything like that. That's what was there at that particular moment in time. Um, 
that's something I, I find interesting. I could walk in and maybe the thing wasn't, would sound terrible, but and I didn't hear what was going on in the middle of it. I just recorded 20 minutes to see what was, was going to happen with it. But I mean, mm. that, that's and my just to, Yeah, just Donny, just as well, there's just a question that's come in. I think Kevin has there, just in relation to it as well. So Kevin, do you want to, it's from Camilla, is it? Yeah, yeah Camilla is asking, uh, Given that so much creative practice is embodied and it's often described as intuitive, is there a limit to what theory can contribute? Um, There's a lovely one for you, Brian, there now as well. <laughs> I'll leave it to Brian. <laughs> I suppose you could say whose theory? Um, uh, I suppose theory in that sense isn't, isn't, isn't singular. Um, uh, I, just if I could go back very briefly and then I'll address the, 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 the other point. Um, yeah, there is a singular pursuit that might be necessary, but I think coming out of the last 18 months around COVID, when galleries were closed, say within my field, like there's a, over my shoulder on the right, there's frame pieces in bubble wrap that are just at the moment, wood, glass, paper, and graphite. That's what they are. And they're not ignited in the sense of, of a reception. Okay. And I think that's the piece that's, that's missing. I could go on and not show these, you know, have a very solitary singular life or not talk to conservators or not do different collaborations with people. That's one way of working. And I think in, in, in a curious way, maybe for people who are in academia, you, you, you work with people a lot, all the time, teams, 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 all the, no, I don't mean Microsoft teams, I mean teams of people all the time, teams of students, all, and it's really rich and really rewarding and nourishing of one's own practice but maybe there's the counterbalance for me to be singular, but it's like then what the work demands and the work demands not to be sitting over in my studio um, dormantly talking <laughs> to the wall, you know, that you are sort of waiting for that form of, of, of recognition. In relation to the theory one, I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, it was slightly glib to say who's theory, but I, I, I think that theory isn't singular. So there can be theories of emancipation, theories of um, distribution, theories of reception that don't hold back necessarily forms. And I think within a creative practice that we can very much build and create our own scaffold around, like a theoretical scaffolding around the issues that are pertinent to things that are happening within a, within a practice. So in a sense, I think for me, it, it, things are porous and the theory is porous. Theory can support a hunch or an inclination or an attitude or a misunderstanding as well, right. rather than maybe kind of rigidly holding something back. And if I can, actually, there's just one more if we have time. I think we do. We have our three minutes, three minutes left as well. There's a very interesting question from Mary McCarthy. Donny, if I could direct it towards you again. Um, can you talk about the unanticipated way that gives rise to creative impetus? In the Oh, sorry, this is actually for Brian, uh, for the artist who did the drawings. But can I actually go to Donny first on that? Because um, in terms of, Donny, what you were talking about, Chance, I think that's an interesting question for you as well. It's, it's a total belief in, in the work. I mean, if it's if it's totally silent, I mean, my work primarily aspect of it is listening. And if people are listening to it and there's no sound, they're still listening. And then, I, you know, it can come on anytime the sound can come on. I mean, I can go away to the woods and spend eight hours standing there as a tree listening. And I'm quite happy doing that. It's a great day's work for me, you know? And um, so any sound can appear at that particular time and I'm listening to it, you know? so. I mean, I, I firmly believe like in the, the to, well, it has always worked for me, this whole thing of indeterminacy and uh, getting in, uh, a new listening to something every time you listen to it. Well, words of wisdom, Donny. Uh, Brian, can I put that to you now, since it was directed, Mary directed it towards you also. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I mean, sometimes the impetus of what I deal with, so like that destroyed Vermeer, the love letter, how that was stolen, how that was broken, how that was interacted was by chance. The conservation and restoration of artworks can be chance about who's in fashion, who's out of fashion, whose work is painted over, um, who's ended up in a storage unit, who's ended up on um, being being uh, uh, mm -hmm. mislooked after. So in many ways, I kind of think some of my starting point is chance, even though how I address things can seem tight and rigid. Um, things I discovered when I mined down to the practice in the PhD became, you know, the weight of something, how, how paper is torn 
um, all these things suddenly became these really important moments and the chance thing of um, using the wrong pencil, taking the wrong paper off, um, incising something too hard, there's a line there that suddenly opens up a new way of working, changing from drawing on paper to carbon paper, all these kind of usurping of ideas, they're really enriching. Um, and I think to have that attitude towards the unstable and the unfixed can be really nice. Yeah. Okay. For, exa for example, sorry, um, I, I'll be doing a live concert tonight that's streamed as part of Cork Indie Film Festival. And yesterday we did a, a sound check and all my instruments and things are on the table. But I haven't the faintest idea what I'm going to, what instrument I'm going to pick up or what sound making device I'm going to pick up to start that tonight. Like, and that's the way I like to work. I could pick up a guitar, I could pick up a saxophone, I could pick up a stone. I just don't know until I actually sit behind that table tonight and then um, and start working. You know, I might be canting up for five minutes. You know. Well, thank you so much. Um, and with that, I mean, it's just been absolutely wonderful. It's such a wonderful day. Um, so uh, it's it's just so invigorating again uh, to be amongst creative people and hear artists and hear from the artists directly about uh, really what um, what makes them tick and 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 like how they research their work and how they relate that into many ways into uh, their actual day work as well, you know, for, for Brian and Trina uh, inside uh, institutions as well. And Danny, um, you know, Danny now inside uh, UCC as well. So there's a great uh, crossover there, but just to, to be, I, I'm personally very excited that there is such activity in arts practice within third level institutions. And, and such a depth of knowledge and intelligence there. So um, it's been a very, very exciting afternoon for me. And from Solstice, we say thank you very, very much. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to chair the session. Um, don't be stranger. Uh, we hope we will unite with Imbus again in some shape or form and that we can continue our conversations uh, in reality somewhere in Cork, UL, Galway or wherever you may be uh, and, and actually continue into the night. So thanks again. It's been such a buzz and I totally feel reinvigorated in my practice as well. So thank you, Danny, Brian and Trina and Imbas Mel and Orla. Nell is here as well, uh, behind the scenes, very, very um, shy now. And Kevin. And, uh, and just like, it's been such a wonderful day. So I'll hand back to Mel now. Thank you. Thanks, Belinda. Thank you very much, Belinda. Don't go anywhere. You sound like you're going somewhere. You've got to stay now for another while. Oh, no, I'm staying, I'm staying, but it's just... Fantastic. You know. Thank you for that wonderful chairing um, as well, Belinda. And of course, uh, thank you to Danny and to Brian uh, and to Trina. That was a very uh, inspiring and uh, powerful and really quite moving um, uh, set of presentations. Um, and uh, 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 the image of Danny, um, standing in the forest for eight hours doing a good day's work will stay with me for a long time. Really, really beautiful.